Uh, I want to thank our guest uh, speaker for this week. Um, this is Celeste Nevadas. She is the Chief of Clinical Services for the Local Mental Health Authority of El Paso. So Celeste, thank you so much for joining our class this week. Um, let me start off by saying, I know you've lived in a couple different cities. Um, given your experience and the current position you're in, how is leading on the border different from other non-border situations? Yeah, I've lived and worked in positions of leadership within Lubbock, Texas, um, Phoenix and surrounding areas, because everybody's real touchy about like Mesa, it's not the same as Glendale, um, but the Phoenix area and then El Paso. And every place has been so different in the fact that the issues are so different in every place that I've worked. Um, and then the response to me being a leader has been different in each one of those regions. Um, I think the other thing too that I have to attribute is the fact that age, I was, you know, 19, 20 when I was in Lubbock versus early 20s um, in Phoenix. And now I'm in my thirties, um, in a, in a position of power here in El Paso. And it's different because, so the issues are obviously different regionally, um, which is really important. I think it's really important in order to be a successful leader, wherever you live is to understand the region that you're working in. I think we all bring that experience to whatever position we're in, but understanding that you have some expertise of X, Y, and Z, but working and living and being a leader in a specific community, namely like a border town like here, um, the needs are different. So you have to operate differently. And I think being in El Paso, I mean, we are, we touch New Mexico, Texas, and then what is Mexico within 45 minutes, depending on where you're at from each other. So the issues are different. The way that we look at the world is different here. Our values, our beliefs, um, everything about this enmeshment of all of these different cultures makes up who and what we are here. But even if you look at a different border town, even let's say Laredo, it's still gonna operate differently. So really understanding the region and where you're working at makes a huge difference, I think for me. Yeah, and um, you know, as someone in a, as someone like you in a position of power, you, you're in a unique position in that often minorities and women both have a more difficult time reaching leadership positions, um, given the inequalities found in many organizations and industries. How does that perspective influence your approach to leadership? It's interesting that you ask. I take a big sigh just because there's a lot that I think about. I love my field of work, mental health is I'm so lucky and, and so honored to be part of this community because we are pretty diverse and open and welcoming. It's in the nature of our work. And so we are much more accepting of, of different races and cultures, ethnicities, gender, and those folks being a power in general. But then I think about, um, you know, some of the positions that I was ignored in or was never promoted in because I am a female. Um, and that was, that was really rough. Um, and I think to ignore it is, is I don't wanna say ignorant because it's got a negative connotation, but to ignore it would be dismissive, right? But then to focus on it so much that that's what's driving you, I think you'll lose sight of whatever, what other people are also bringing to the table and what their traumas that they bring in and how different they are from yours. So just recognizing um, for me, that I am different and that's okay. And that, and leaning into that as a strength rather than a barrier has helped me tremendously and, and my self-esteem and the way that I approach things rather than saying like, oh, it's cause I'm this and cowering. It's more like, but I'm this. And that's why I'm perfect for that. Right. And that's really helped shape the way that I look at things. And so as a leader, how do you ensure that you're considering the many different identities of your team, but also of like your clients? Yeah, hold back. Pull, and, and I don't mean hold back your opinions or thoughts or values. I mean, hold back as far as holding time or space. Mm -hmm. My organization is laughing at me right now. They're so over this, but I've implemented like a new rule. And they're, ah, it's okay, we'll get there. Um, most introverts need at least seven extra seconds to respond to something. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can't tell, I'm super extroverted, very chatty and very comfortable. Um, so if somebody asks a question, I'm going to answer it. Or I'm, if they're like, do you have any questions? I'm like, yes, I do. And then I go. But that's my personality. That's me being firstborn. All of these things we talk about before the order. Um, 
and a performer and all these things my whole life, but giving even those extra seven seconds for folks who are introverted, who have trauma, who have years of experience being shamed or being ridiculed for asking a dumb question um, makes a huge difference. So that's first and foremost, making little spaces for folks to be able to fill it. And then recognizing that everybody has a story, um, big or small, it doesn't matter, it's all relative. And so if I just hold even in meetings for those seven seconds, it's one way of allowing space for other people to fill it. And then also recognizing that other people have different experiences than I do um, and allowing them to share whatever that is and, and encouraging them when I can see that they're not comfortable sharing it, right? Like I can feel you holding back. And most of us can feel it, especially most of us who are in leadership positions that are empathetic and we can read a room pretty well, all that. When you can feel somebody holding back and just kind of hanging out in the background, meeting with them off the side or calling them being like, hey, I noticed you know, you look like you wanted to say something, but you didn't. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Or can we talk about that? Tell me what your experience has been like previous to working here. And, you know, some of my students are already in positions of power. However, some of them are in this class in preparation for like future opportunities. Uh, last week, we discussed the relationship between uncertainty and anxiety and in-groups and out-groups. Um, we also went over conflict styles. Um, what advice would you give to a student who is preparing for a future leadership opportunity in terms of that connection between anxiety and uncertainty? You are always going to be uncertain, right? Like there is no certainty within to, to be a leader is to be vulnerable. It, to be um, a game changer, to make any kind of change in the world, that means that you're putting yourself out in a vulnerable position that's a risk, a risk for failure, a risk for just name calling, for ridicule, for everything else in the world. Um, so uncertainty is certain, if anything. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's just lean it. Like, yeah. you are for certain going to be uncertain. Um, and I think the more that we recognize that and just accept that, that we're not going to know for sure. It can ease that anxiety that's actually secondary to that uncertainty. Um, I, full disclosure, love Brene Brown. Um, if you all have not talked about her or you're not reading or listening to her podcast, get on it. Um, Rising Strong is her specific leadership book for that. And I'm rereading that right now. Um, and she talks about like getting in the arena, arena and it's a Theodore Roosevelt speech. It's beautiful. But basically like if you're not in the arena getting your butt kicked that's what leaders do mm -hmm. then your opinions don't really matter to me and i've framed that where like i know i'm gonna like i'm anxious because i don't know how this is going to turn out but i'm certain that anything can happen yeah. and so yeah. recognizing the difference between the two is really helpful um and managing that anxiety the best way we can because we can't manage uncertainty that's for sure uh, and, and she has a, I think is a special on Netflix, right? Correct? Yes. So if y'all haven't. Three or four times, it's great. <laughs> yeah, so if you haven't watched that, I, I highly encourage you. I've seen it already, but it's really great. Uh, so I'm going to rattle off some stats here. So Latinos are, and Latinx is, uh, are the now the largest ethnic minority group at 17% of the country's population and comprise 21% of the millennial generation. Uh, Latin, Latinx has accounted for uh, half of the overall U.S.'s population growth. And at, at this rate, Latin, Latinxes are expected to make up one-fourth of the U.S. population by 2025 and one-third by 2050. Today, they have 1.5 trillion purchasing power. On the other hand, Latino, Latinxes are nearly invisible in corporate leadership. Only 4% of executive officer positions in Fortune 500 firms were held by uh, Hispanics, according to the 2016 Corporate Inclusion Index published by the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility. Now, the border provides a unique experience for the leadership at many organizations are Latinx. When the power dynamic shifts and the minority is a majority, what are some things a Latinx in a leadership position should consider in terms of power dynamics? some really great stats and at first i was like yeah and then i was like no right like <laughs> yeah we're doing wonderful but we're still not climbing up yet um so we're holding space but we're right. holding it laterally we're not climbing up at all um not at all we are but not at the rate that we should be i guess i should say at least nationally on the border it's a little bit different right on the border it's it's 
it's so comfortable um, in, in that that's not a conversation. Like if I got turned down for a job, it wasn't because like, oh, is it because of my last name? Like if anything, right. the people interviewing me typically have the same last name. But I can tell you that wasn't the case in Lubbock. Um, and I am a very proud Texas Tech Red Reader. Um, but I can tell you that when I was in a position there as a manager, of not a very serious job, um, one of the kiddos that I was working with, and he was literally a high school kid, was like, oh man, something, something, like, you're so whatever. Like it was supposed to be complimentary for being Spanish. And I was like, I'm not Spanish, I'm Mexican actually. He's like, they're the same thing. And I was like, those are two different countries, <laughs> um, which is great. But so I think about, I remember being in that moment and being like, like, I don't, I don't even know where to start with you. I guess I could have easily just said like, those are two different countries. But instead I was like, it's easier just to, move along um so my advice or my suggestion then would be to not feel bad to hold up space i think i think about my grandparents who i love and adore and were entrepreneurs and, and had their both own businesses and own their own shops um but my grandfather kind of kind of instilled that in me right like don't cause waves like just smile and nod like and some of that is customer service right the customer's always right and, and be professional and i and thankful for those lessons but some of it was just like why do i need to take that kind of response or behavior why do i need to accept that as a as a respectable response and so that i think can come from cultural or generational uh, systematic learning right of just like just don't cause waves like we didn't work this hard to get here only for you to ruffle a bunch of feathers up right. and, and get everybody all upset. Like, right. And, and depending on your upbringing, obviously I understand that every household's different. Um, I would say no to that. Like, absolutely. Like I stand on the shoulders of my grandfather and his family before him. And that's part of the reason why I, I cause trouble and raise chaos. Right. Is so, that we can exceed and so that we can continue to grow and be in positions of influence and mm -hmm. make a difference for, for our entire community, not just our own cultural background, but for everybody, because every, every culture brings a different influence, population, experience, um, cultural differences, like everybody brings to the table. It's not this culture, I'm gonna get off on a tangent, this culture of scarcity, like more for you means less for me. Right. It's not real. Like we're operating under it, but it's not. So, you know, feeling like if I get promoted or if I cause a wave or if I complain about this, then I'm taking away from somebody else. And that's mm -hmm. not the case. Yeah. So moving away from that would be really great. I think the other thing I suggest too is, is or, or that I would advise is that even if you are in a position of power, there are still people in your organization. There might be p still be people in your industry that still only see you by your skin color and your last name. So that position mm -hmm. still, that won't give you the uh, credibility that you often think it will, but mm -hmm. oftentimes you'll have to utilize that platform or that title or that role and wield it with whatever power you have and establish yourself in right. those situations. Right. Uh, so for many industries, occupations, and positions, many individuals feel a sense of imposter syndrome. Uh, a new study out of the University of Texas at Austin published in the Journal of Counseling Psychology suggests that the imposter phenomenon, uh, phenomenon in some cases can degrade the mental health of minority students who already perceive prejudices against them. Those who suffer from imposter feelings cannot grasp or believe in their successes, even if they're high achieving, leading them to feel like frauds. Uh, what, what advice would you give to Latinx students, black students, female students, and other students who are part of the marginalized groups, a part of marginalized groups in terms of what they can do to overcome this feeling of being an imposter? I'm so glad we're talking about imposter syndrome, especially in leadership. <laughs> ah, um, it's to, I, like, I, I'm, I'm young in my career, like whatever. I've been a therapist, I've been a clinician for 10 years, but there are so many times where I'm in a room or I'm in a meeting or I'm being interviewed and I'm like, 
do they know like that I'm not important like I don't know why they want to call me like yeah and I it, it, there's a lot of pet talks that come from like my family or my fiance that's like do you like what you've been spatting off like I know this I know this I know, like you are just this really incredible and comp- like confident and, and and whatever person and then the time comes to like perform and I'm like um it's horrible uh-huh. it's horrible oh, yeah um so yeah a lot of um self-work is is needed to sustain that or or to um to fight that off because it'll come right. in waves right. there are moments where you can't touch me you could tell me like so i don't know if you know what you're doing i'd be like get out of my way then and there are other days <laughs> where i'm like maybe i don't <laughs> <laughs> It's horrible. It's horrible. And it can be debilitating. It really can. And I think everybody feels it most, especially if, and when you look sound, look or sound different than the group of people that you're meeting with. Cause then you're like, Oh snap. Like they're going to realize that I should not have been invited to this. And I feel so stupid. Like, and then I think, no, they invited you because you don't look and sound like, everybody else in the room, if they wanted more of that, they would have invited that. Mm -hmm. They didn't, they invited you specifically because you have a different sound, a different look, a different idea, a different methodology um, to whatever solution they're trying to accomplish. So recognizing that you are in a position because you are different and because that you bring that flavor, you bring that expertise to the table, to the room. Um, I have a friend who says this all the time, like, don't apologize for the seat you're taking up at the table. I'm like, oh, yes, mm-hmm. right. Um, you were invited, and sometimes we're not. I've definitely sat in on things that I'm not supposed to be in because um, I felt like <laughs> it was necessary. Yeah. But that is why you are there. That is why people are looking at you for your feedback, mm-hmm. for your expertise, for anything that you're bringing. So if anything, when you're feeling that like, what am I doing here moment? It, it's because you are different. And that's, right. that's exactly what we need during this conversation. So <sighs> imposter syndrome is so real. Um, mm. I, I fight it all, all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I still don't know if like my title or position is real sometimes. Like I feel like I'm gonna wake up one day and my boss is like, it's like, um, <laughs> I don't know why it's been a year, but, and, and I've had whatever. Um, but it, it is, it's something that we have to combat every day. And there are going to be times where people look at you and they might explicitly be judging you, right? Like, should you be here? And that's where you need to rise up and be like, yes, I absolutely need to. But if you're perceiving it, like if they're questioning you, like, well, why do you feel that way? Don't lean into the defensive anxiety mode of like, well, it's because, or, you know, no. I believe this because of that, that lean into that and give the explanation and reasoning. It's not being defensive. It's just backing up whatever idea or theory or solution that you've proposed. So speak up, I guess I could have summed that up in those two words, speak up, but. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I think if you're getting asked either, fully be in a position or to speak at a seminar or to speak in front of whatever it is that you're getting asked to do. It is because either your academic experience, your lived experience, something about you has earned you that right there. And right. sometimes you're, you know, you're right. Sometimes you just happen to be there. And then we can't ignore the fact that oftentimes you're going to be the token, whatever person that it might be. And that might be why they're inviting you there to make sure that there is diversity in the room. And that sucks. And that's really unfortunate. However, that doesn't mean, again, that you can't get that opportunity and get as much out of it as possible. If they're bringing you in there to be the, the, the splash of diversity that they need, then take up as much space as you can mm-hmm. and enlighten mm-hmm. people as often, you know, as often as you can, given the opportunities. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of reading right now um, with Austin Channing Brown, who's fantastic. Also, need more reading material. Um, and she talks about that and she's like, people want a sprinkle of diversity or they want to con- like just a confetti, like, right. Like a little yeah. bit of it. And, and that's frustrating sometimes. A lot of times it's, uh, it's frustrating, but it's a start. And I'm not saying we should be okay with status quo. I'm saying, take a start. Like we all got to start somewhere, take that, get some more confetti in the room, 
mm-hmm. and use that position. Like now that you've been invited to sit at that table, like invite some more people in to, right. to really cultivate um, a culture for change or, or diversity or uh, difficult conversations, whatever needs to happen within the organization that you're existing in. Mm-hmm. I mean, invite backup. Right. Um, and so the next question I have, so there are some situations where there's someone who is not from the border, they obtain a leadership role on a border town or in a border town. And I think El Paso is so unique because the minority, the Latinx minority is a majority here. Right. And so for someone who is white or someone who is black or someone who is essentially not Latinx, what are some important considerations to think about in terms of being in that type of situation where you are getting put into or moved to a border town in a position of leadership? I think going back to my first point is that learn your community, learn where you're working. Um, my my um, mom is not from here. She is born in St. Louis, raised in North Carolina, moved her here her junior year of high school. So we talk a lot about that and what her experience was like it's been a while, but still. Um, and I think rather than argue or try to say like, no, but I've been here long enough. I understand. Like, just like, you're right. I'm not from here, but let's get started. Or I'm not from here. Tell me what I need to know. Or tell me what's important to you. Maybe don't tell me what I need to know. Tell me what's important to you so that I can get have a better understanding and we can get working on a solution rather than the argument or the hang up be that I'm not from here and you are, right? Yeah because then we're spinning our wheels talking about something that's not solution focused. So I think leaning into the fact that you aren't from here, this is a funky community. Like I get it. Most, there's a lot of folks that are born and raised here and have been here for a very long time. So if you're feeling like the other thing too, is if you are feeling like an outsider, call it because most of us, and I can speak for myself, like, who are from here will rope that in and be like, whoa, 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 let me, let me take care of you. Like, let me, mm-hmm. I need you to feel included because that's not what we're about either. We're not like, you're not from here. You don't know anything. Um, I think it's rather you're not from here. So don't act like you are or that, you know, right. And I know that that I'm cringing when I say that just cause it's, mm-hmm. that can sound really aggressive and I don't, that's not my intention at all. But I think the minute that, somebody says like, I'm not from here and I just feel like I'm hitting a wall and I don't know what I'm missing. And you invite in that conversation, I can say, well, the truth is, you you know, X, Y, Z, you've been doing this, this, and this. If you're willing to have that conversation and really take in feedback, that's a big one. If you're willing to take in that feedback, people will make sure that you understand them and they understand you, yeah. which will make your life as a leader so much easier. Perfect. And uh, lastly, any other advice you want to give students in terms of being a successful leader in the borderland? Yeah, I'm really, I'm thankful that folks are taking this class and are dedicated to their leadership. Um, I'm doing some, I'm doing a lot of reading, I'm doing some reading right now on what's called trauma stewardship. And it's really shifting the way that I think about um, just my work and what I do. And just because I've accomplished set amount of goals or titles or whatever doesn't mean that my work is done. And so I encourage you all to continue to take leadership workshops, courses. Um, I took last year, I was part of the national council for behavioral health and it was, I don't know how long it was eight, nine month uh, leadership program and just completely turned me upside down. I thought I was doing things well and just learned so much because there's always more to learn. So in short, I guess I could stop rambling. Never stop <laughs> learning. Never stop learning just because you take this class and ace it or don't, whatever. The, the point is that leadership is something that you constantly have to refine and rework. It's not a checkbox or like a to-do list where you're like, I did this. So now I'm right. done and I'm perfect. Right? Like, always learn, always continue to invite that growth. Um, And people will recognize that within you and you'll continue to grow in in bigger and better and more leadership positions. Perfect. So thank you so much for joining us this week. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.